do we have the presenters for today? Eugene is here. Uh, Fengbin? Is Fengbin here? Not yet. Eugene, do you know which order people are going in today? You're going first? Okay. Do you have extra slides that you're going to use? No, you're just going to use the ones there. Which ones are, do um, you remember the name? Is it the 6B7 slides? It's the 8A. 8A. Okay, let me go get those. I don't think they're here yet. separate decks for each of these. Hello, can you hear us? I hear you. Jam, I can't hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, well, first I'm going to download it. What happened? Oh, our wireless one died. Hello, can you hear me? Get started in a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Eugene, you also had your own slides, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're almost ready. Um, for some reason, the cable to the microphone is missing, so we can't hook up the microphone, but I think we'll still be able to hear uh, if you're on remote. So I think there's only Tram on remote right now. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can okay, you hear good. Yeah, if you need to speak, uh, just speak up a little louder because I think um, the, the volume is not up very high. Okay, sure. Okay. Can you see the screen of the iPad? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, today we're gonna go through the next round. So this is actually, actually, week eight's lecture, uh, but as you all know, we postponed uh, one, one week. So um, 
uh, we have our presenters today for free presenters to go over uh, lecture eight, uh, as well as the guest lecture by Ilya. Okay, so um, as usual, I'm not uh, well connected. Uh, I'm missing the power again, so I have to go back and get the power supply for the Mac. So um, uh, I will let our first presenter start, okay? So do you know how to operate the iPad? Okay, you scroll using two fingers up and down. Okay, um, I think just like that. Okay, and then when you want to annotate, you just use the pen to annotate and you can change it to erase or to erase. Okay, if you need to use a, another application to uh, write, are you gonna write any equations? No, okay, then you're, you're all good to go. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Joni and uh, I'm going to cover the review of Brown and of strengths and weakness for autoregressive models. Um, so we talked about pixel INN, pixel CNN, pixel CNN plus and pixel snail a little bit uh, during lecture one. Um, and uh, so here we want to just look at, take a look at uh, some of the samples uh, examples that uh, was drawn from the, uh, some of these models and see how it has been progressed in the quality of the samples. Uh, so in 2015, MIT was uh, uh, introduced. And um, uh, as you can see from here, uh, each of the lines here are a different um, mask uh, being applied to the model. And uh, based on the quality of the picture of the samples, you can see that it's uh, not as clear. Um, it's uh, like some of the numbers are not very identifiable. Um, um, then in 2016, we have pixel INN and CNN. Um, and you can see that the, the, the model is still not uh, very distinctive in terms of like what class is being re represented. However, the colors and, um, and the sharpness of the, of the image are a little bit uh, better. Um, I during the lecture they didn't really cover like what is the advantage of uh, of uh, pixel and and CNN as compared to MATE. Uh, I was trying to read up on it, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Does anyone have any uh, opinion on this? On why MATE is better? Like what is actually was uh, improved when we move from MATE to pixel and and pixel CNN? Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> um, um, then in WaveNet, they introduced the dilated convolution whereby uh, it kind of increased the receptive field uh, for the model. Um, and here we have another example of a model that's called Video Pixel Networks. Uh, if you click here, there's a paper. So I think it's uh, basically uh, it's conditioned all the frames based on the previous frames, uh, and it uses uh, LSTM models to uh, to do that conditioning, and uh, they were able to generate a model of uh, a robot picking up an object, and this looks pretty realistic. That uh, is kind of realistically moving uh, from frame to frame with a logical order. Um, then uh, we have another model called pix subscale pixel networks. That, and I think in this model, they kind of train it on a lower scale, uh, uh, on lower resolution of the image. And then um, then was able to generate a higher, gen um, higher size image based on that um, prior. Um, then there's this model, which was not covered in the previous lecture, which is Tyrico autoregressive image models with auxiliary decoders. Um, yeah. Um, and um, this is a sample that was drawn from the open uh, AI GPT-2 models. Um, so the, mm, uh, the model was able to take in a sample uh, which is in black color about um, a unicorn being discovered and is able to reason and take the logic of um, 
the unicorn telling a story about the unicorn taking talking about English and everything. Um, uh, so you can see if you read the text, it seems that the model is able to uh, use the logic that is given in the um, in the given text as well as um, uh, uh, able to connect the logic from during the text that is generated as well. So if you we look at here is the history of all the uh, similar uh, language models and well, if you read the text, it seems that it has progressed from uh, during the when we move from Trigram to uh, INN, uh, LSTM and Transformer and the text that we uh, see above uh, well, is uh, um, um, another Transformer um, and you can see that the not only is the uh, logic of the sentence is um, is better but it also has able to uh, to carry the logic from sentence to sentence into a kind of a logical story. Um, so what are the advantage of uh, autoregressive models? Um, I know how has, um, what has um, improved uh, during the past a few years um, that have brought into the better samples that we've seen from autoregressive models. Um, so let me just move to the last slide. Um, so um, we are able to, uh, with the bigger computing powers, uh, we are able to train with a larger, larger batch size, and um, uh, we can build a more complex models with more hidden units and more layers as well. Um, and um, they are able to come up with clever ways to condition on auxiliary variables, which I guess is the last sample image that we see in the previous examples. And uh, they also mentioned that uh, they can do some pre-processing with the uh, well, with the training. So instead of just fit, feeding it uh, with an image, they kind of pre-process the image into some kind of raw byte data before feeding it to, into the model. Um, and then um, it's expected when you train these models that you uh, spend several days or weeks to train it uh, before it, um, um, you can get a very good uh, models. Um, and they also mentioned something interesting about uh, taking away the assumptions. Um, so some of the assumptions um, that was uh, assumed in the past uh, in the previous models, when they you take away and then you try something new, you can get uh, more new result. Uh, so the lecturer mentioned um, uh, previously, um, um, you only use convolutional models for images, but then um, you, it doesn't have to always be the case. Um, what else? Um, I kind of forgot. Um, um, then uh, what we have, um, but of course the uh, big um, advances that uh, we have made is the architectural advances with uh, the new models that have been uh, researched and, um, and introduced. So we covered the mass and um, our causal convolution models, uh, which uh, enable us to use the uh, to build uh, an autoregressive kind of more structure whereby each uh, uh, um, each uh, pixel, each image is only able to see the previous um, uh, the previous uh, pixels uh, that come before it, so that we can have like an autoregressive um, structure on top of an, an auto encoder. And then we talked about the dilated convolutions, which enable the model to have a larger uh, receptive field. Uh, and because of that, it can um, have uh, better uh, context and uh, gen maybe have better logic as well. And then uh, we have transformers, um, which I assume the advantage is that uh, we can have... What is the advantage of a transformer? Self-attention? Mm. What is the advantage of self-attention? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's your name? 
Cynthia. So Cynthia mentioned that uh, Transformers is able to use self-attention and because of that have longer range of memory than LSTM. Uh, does anyone else have anything to share about Transformers other than Cynthia? I, I'm, I'm read something about better parallelization, but I don't know whether it applies to Transformers. Yeah, it's, it's like because uh, it's using sort of like a stimulus or pulling something like a normal little hands to uh, process everything and push out of the way. Like yeah. SPM is also good for like what happened in the previous time step when you keep on doing the same one. Yes. Yeah. Transformers is like that. Uh, we know what happened previously and you know, done everything in one go. Yeah. Agree. Awesome. Thanks for contributing. Um, and so next is the loss functions. Um, so the more the lecture mentioned that um, is very um, the quality of the model is very heavily rely on the um, on the um, on the loss function that uh, that we choose. And um, it seems that they say that um, the loss function that uh, autoregressive models is relying heavily on. Uh, cross entropy loss. So I don't know. So. Um, so, what is the future of auto regressive models? Um, so, um, we are still at the beginning of the regressive models and in the future uh, well, some of the areas for development would be to uh, advance with model parallelism so we've seen some of that with um, I guess with um, with transformer and now um, with more parallelism I guess that we can do um, we can train it on bigger uh, data um, for example, um, and or we can also train on a bigger model as well. So, for example, um, um, the language model um, um, that we can use um, to train could have like trillion of parameters. Um, so, um, uh, another thing um, that could be interesting would be to um, have the same model for both text and pixels, so that. Um, 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 and and um, I don't have any comment on, on the same models for both text and pixels. Um, but for another areas that we could develop on is the um, combining several models that to have a hybrid model so that you can have the advantage of a multiple at one. So I think we have covered some models that um, 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 that have like very low sampling uh, speed, which is quite, kind of um, what where we started with, where with the first uh, autoregressive models, and then um, when you change the architecture, you can have uh, a faster, faster sampling uh, speed. Um, so some of that is being developed with uh, wave ENN, RNN. Um, And also, we kind of briefly mentioned about uh, self-attention. So I guess uh, it could be uh, even more leveraged in the future, so that um, we can use self-attention to introduce in uh, more uh, inductive bias into the model. Any of you guys are using uh, autoregressive models for your project? No? No one? So everyone is doing GAN? Um, so uh, what are the negatives of uh, autoregressive models? Uh, the first no negative point is that it doesn't have a single layer of learned representation. Um, the next thing is that uh, the sampling time is no slow because you have to generate uh, one um, uh, x one first before you can generate x two and x n. So uh, it's kind of have to uh, progress slowly on the size of the uh, of the dimension of the of the object. 
um, and um, because of the low sampling time, um, slow sampling time is not directly usable for downstream tasks. And um, the last uh, negative would be that it has uh, no interpolations. So unlike GAN, whereby uh, you can um, easily um, take another someone else model and kind of um, apply it to another uh, another uh, class or another object. I mean, another pro problem. Um, you can do it with autogressive models. Um, Does anyone have very strong feeling about autogressive models and want to add more things here? My apologies, apologies because I was trying to read up on this, but is uh, I was still at very basic level to, 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 uh, to discuss the negatives and positives. So I'm kind of reading off the slide here, uh, but like let's use this to kind of discuss and contribute ideas. Um, if if you have are actively researching on this topic and or like or if you have questions on on this. And can just use this as a forum. Any any other questions? If not, then I give it to Suichi uh, to talk about flow models. So we have discussed an ICEE of real MVP glow and flow plus plus then a uh, nice which is basically real MVP without the skill design coupling 
um, it produced good MNIST digits, <laughs> but the samples on CIFAR and SVHN is not that good. And then they did real MVP with better architectures which is with more skill, so they produce much better faces and room images. <clears throat> um, so when they use GLOW, it's real MVP model, and then we move the batch normalization, introduce act normalization, and the one cross one convolution flow. So this this is a demo where where there are like two five six plus two five six resolution. It is Then for this is uh they are comparing the it's like apart from progress and <coughs> sample quality, like the bits per per dimension and make them comparable with autoregressive models. So for instance, the four plus plus achieves these bits per dimension on the CIFAR image net, and these are comparable to the pixel RNN and CNN. Uh, the first auto regressive models that were trained. So, for instance, the CFAR bit per dim is better than the pixel CNN with them. Uh, this is similar for the image net and it's comparable to the pixel RNN. So this means that the flow models have a lot of promise in terms of trying to use modern architectures and more modern flows and put them on a large scale. So you can produce results of comparable quality to autoregressive models. So this is in spite of having sequential sampling procedure. So this is the future of flow models. Uh, you can first learn the math for coupling and you can try to keep closing the gap with autoregressive models and you can try to use some kind of hybrid flows you don't need constant time sampling uh, you can uh, lock the number of pixels Uh, it is better to use fewer flows that are very expressive. Um, expressive means that uh, just throwing a lot of layers per flow versus having a few layers. But lots of flows. Uh, the usage of multi-scale laws. Um, so like in Glow, every layer they take half. So instead of the variables and governize it instead of just governizing what you get at the end. So this will help in terms of producing better samples or better bits per dim. Uh, then you can also have a uh, better representation learning with flows and finally uh, how you initialize the flow matters a lot like things like act non flow or data dependent initialization helps a lot in terms of beginning the training at the level of bits per din that makes sense for instance if you are training on an 8 bit data set uh, you should uh, start with approximately eight points something.
Uh, so in terms of looking at it from a functional perspective, you can think about trying to achieve glow level samples with fewer parameters. So the samples that you saw in the video, they use 615 million parameters. Then the models are really big. So you can use them for any kind of compression. Uh, flows can also produce amazing samples of the level guns, but at the same time still have small models. <laughs> because the guns are often having very few parameters, which are less than 100 million parameters, and also trying to scale this up. So these samples were in 256 plus 256. Uh, you can try to improve these to one megapixel images. Uh, then you can try dimension reduction of flows and then trying to train the conditional flow models. The same kind of advances made possible with conditional auto regressive models can also be possible with conditional flow models. So in summary, there's a long way to go before gun, sample, gun level samples and autoregressive mod, model level likelihood scores combined with stable training and a fixed set of engineering practices. Like it makes sense to use a lot of flows or fewer flows. So in terms of negatives, uh, you will have a lot of noise as big as X if you do not do any kind of reductions. So the models will become very big. Um, and then it is very brittle in terms of how you train it and you need to initialize it very carefully. So you must uh, it's also something like how you train neural networks earlier. So next, Shetty will present on the. Uh, so after flows, we saw little variable models, and like what we went through during the, the durations of variable. Vari Variation of lower bound, so weak sleep, and VAE is the extensions of VAE. Like, uh, there are some means, means net digits. Then after a while, using more modern decoders, we can actually achieve excellent interpolation of bedrooms. And, um, pixel VAE. And image uh, an image uh, image net as well. Then uh, there are some well known way applications here. Uh, you can click on the link on the slides to know more about it. Uh, so uh, I will touch on the advantages of the VAE. is the notion uh, it's Uh, it, uh, it, it, it's compressed the uh, data and it's give, it gives you a lot of likelihood. And um, it's good in interpolations and respect, retrospective analysis of what, what the model learns. It also disentangle representations. And also, it's it's very good because it's an all-in-one model. So it's a it's it's a generative model, density model, latent variables, and dimension dimensionality of reduction dimensionality reduction. So it's everything. It's all in. It's jack of all trade. But yeah, so uh, it also has its disadvantages. Uh, the samples uh, can be blurry and the. The assumptions may be too limiting, so it may not be able to uh, generalize well. And yeah, and it's still re really a 
ongoing work. And uh, there may be other better ways to learn better representation or get better samples. But like, uh, like the parameters, it doesn't even use the number of parameters. It used less than 100 million parameters, which is not even the level or uh, same level of flows and GAN. So it's, uh, so it's just a check of all three, but not the best at anything that you want to do. But it's, uh, it's a very promising field and you can, you can, uh, it's ent across entropy base and weakly also regressive. And so uh, in future you can do, uh, have more powerful posteriors and uh, you can use discrete latent variable models to prevent posterior collapse and still be able to use pixels seen like decoders. Uh, then after we, we, we proceed to GAN. GAN, uh, like on the, on the left side of the, the style GAN, we can just generate a realistic human image, even though the, Im the person doesn't even exist. The, on the right side is the big GAN is also uh, as the as the name suggests, it, it's big again, so it's <laughs> big. <laughs> but uh, it's hard to predict against uh against them in future. Like it, it's hard to predict because even though the the like the human image and the big again look quite uh quite accurate, but we can can't say for sure what's the future for them. So it's really uh, an ongoing field uh, in research. Yeah, like just now, uh, I think then for now, we can still only handle an image with a central object, like uh, uh, a picture with only one image, one face, facial image. But so in future, maybe perhaps we can, uh, can it can, handle more complex things with, with multiple people and with multiple people with objects, yeah. And uh, in future also can uh, have new approaches, conditioning tricks and uh, architecture design. Uh, and it can have, we can have deeper models with fewer parameters and larger batch sizes because uh, uh, GAN use more than 1 million of parameters and to, it takes time. So if, uh, Uh, so if we really want to like that, that leads to us to talk about the negatives. Like it may take weeks or to run the models. So it's very hard to predict to know which piece, which model actually help us predict better because it yeah because the model is the complexity is high. Uh, yeah, it's time consuming. Uh, and also, uh, like currently, there are many models in uh, that may work. So there's uh, a lot of engineering works, but there may not be enough like theory evidence to prove it. Uh, I'll skip that. So uh, just like. Uh, telescope and 
all the, all the a lot of technology advances in the past, they came up with the engineering device first. Then they then they had the theory on the right to support them. So maybe we should be positive about the future of GANs. Yeah. So uh so how to choose Thank you. 
terrible. Why would you want to make me terrible? But And then for the first half of the course, we've been talking really about the idea that you know either the sampling or the density estimation is bad, right? One or the other. Like one is going to run in parallel and one is going to run in parallel. Right? So depending on what the network uh, aspect is. What about this implicit model? What are we doing with this implicit model that's been in some ways?
what do you want to learn for the Wi-Fi for the sampling or for the uh, NCM transition? And you know, whether you get away with just one or the other, or what do you need both? And if you need both, then you need to go for something in the middle path of the of the Okay. So I I would like if you guys have any comments, this is a really fertile part of the discussion. So this is really the central part of the course, right? Like all these models, you can go research on all those models. But you know, to decide which model to choose from is actually a hard problem, right? Our, our machine learning uh, undergraduates are doing this all the time. They say, okay, I saw this archive paper, or I, I saw this YouTube video, or whatever, and I want to use this model for this data, and I'm like, okay, well, why? Because this is the first model that seems to work for me, right? Because I was able to replicate it because I was able to fork the code and run the GitHub. But that doesn't mean it's the right thing. Right? So we want to get some intuition among the people in our class, what's the right model to use in the right So any questions for me? Because uh, I have a kind of common use of higher language methods to solve very complex problems so that I think it is more efficacy if then learn the by that numbers some real numbers and then multiply so that you get some some central output. So why is it called density? It's not really called density at all, right? I think the, the point is like you have real density and real density and you know it's not even part of the model. Right? So I don't even use this as a reason you should choose a density to get a lot of numbers. Right? But again it's not calculated. Yeah, I think that's that's a correct interpretation, right? But uh, I mean, the way the GAN does it is simply it doesn't like make it so clear that half of it's hard to make it make sense, right? You're not calculating the entire data. So it's taking the direct route, right? It's using the discriminator to say that it's a less taxable time. It makes it sound like you have to go train the generator to, to um, make it easier. That cycle doesn't necessarily have a positive Other questions? So I think you can see that GAN got a quite a different use, right? That they did not need to use the high probability generator, at least it's like optimized so that it looks like a sample of whether the generator is useful or not.
Yeah, I think it's more of a theoretical uh, decision. Right? Practical means you can get a density model. Right? It's a computable with these models on the other side. Right? Approximate the effect you give up, you end up with this max and this minus and this minus and this minus and this minus and this minus. So maybe that's just a theoretical skill, but from a, um, an application standpoint, it may not matter. Uh, so here are some get line guidelines to choose uh, which model to use. So if you only care about density and uh, not sampling, then go for autoregressive models. But if you care about sampling time, but not too much, autoregressive is still fine. Just use weekly autoregressive models. Yeah. But if uh if you really can't afford linear sampling, then use weaker autoregressive models such as parallel pixel CN. Uh, flow models are good for modeling densities of continuous value data, and uh, better for discrete. Larger models needed for complex data sets. Uh, the mapping, the mapping the continuous values from one domain to Gaussian, but for discrete, we need more progress. But even though we are making them, but it's still not there yet. So if you just want to try the simplest thing first, maybe. Uh, if you want to make sure that something works at all, uh. Or like I just want to see some signs of life. You don't have to comp have you don't have a lot of compute. Then you just use a variational autoencoder. A, a carefully implemented uh, variational autoencoder should work. So when should we use scans? Uh, When, if you want cool samples, really large images, high quality data sets, or if you uh, want train class conditional models, uh, if you want to apply things like image to image translation, go from segmentation mask to actual images. Just keep adding more and more texture patterns, color patterns. And if you only care about perceptual quali uh, quality and want, one more controllable generation and don't have a lot of compute, then that is the best choice. So Eugene, we will touch on self-supervised learning.
Is there a way that you can just like tap to the next slide so it doesn't uh it might be whether uh, let's see what is this nope not this you can try to this. open it in another application all right uh, that might work better yep that would be great so uh try after yep. that i think this will work Okay, that looks good so far. Right. Okay, so I will go straight into semi-supervised learning. Well, I have not had a lot of time to go through the materials very in depth. So what I will present to you today is more of an intuition behind what semi-supervised learning is all about. Okay, so um, if you're looking for rigor, I guess I will not be able to provide you in this presentation. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so what is semi-supervised learning? Um, essentially what you have in, let's, let's talk about like two different kinds of learning that you have so far, right? You have supervised learning, right? Supervised learning is where you have like a bunch of data and all these data are labeled. And what you're trying to learn is to try to find out what is the probability of Y given X, right? Essentially that's, that's what supervised learning is. Um, but what if now you introduce a bunch of unlabeled data? Unlabeled data are cheap, right? It's really cheap. So we can actually have a bunch of them. And now if you have a bunch of un unlabeled data, can we use them in some ways to improve the performance of our, our supervised model in some way, right? So this is the topic that we want to discuss today. So let us start with a very simple model, okay? Uh, in fact, it's so simple that we're gonna try to reinvent this model from scratch. Okay, so let's, let's start with supervised learning first, right? In supervised learning, what do we have? We have some data x, right? Uh, we put this data x some way into, oh, sorry, how do I go back? Uh, yeah, so we fit this into some kind of a network, right? So this network will help you to predict what the y is, right? Uh, let's call it y hat, okay? Then what you need to do is you want to train this to be well, you put a real label in, and then you put these two together into say a loss function, like uh, if you're doing classification, this will be um, cross entropy, right? So you put into a binary cross entropy area and then you back propagate it, right? Simple. So this is our base. Now what we have is a bunch of unlabeled data. So let's, to make this even more clear, um, is there an eraser too? Um, it's okay, I will draw, oh, no. There is no eraser to, cool. Okay, this works. All right, so in this particular setting, uh, wait. In this particular setting, we, not, we don't always have like labels, right? We don't always have Ys. So what we do when we don't have the labels? Does anyone have like, any ideas? You want to try reinventing this? Okay. So here's an insight, right? If you have some image, 
right? Let's say an image of a Marco. And then I tilt this marker a bit. Is this still a Marco? It's still a Marco, right? <laughs> so, so in some sense, we can use this insight. What do we do is, instead of just feeding this data X into the model, we are going to feed it into some kind of a structure that will perturbate, perturbate this image, right? Now, um, so this is a perturbation. So you could do things like add noise into it. You could like rotate the image. You could flip the image. You know, all sorts of different things you can do with it. All right. So if you fit this into this perturbation, this x tilde. Uh, if you fit it twice, your s tilde and your x, let's call it prime, will be different. Right? It will be slightly different. And so when you fit into this, when you fit into this classifier, the logics that you come up from it is going to be different too, right? So, but what we will expect is that since they come from the same x, we want these two logics to be as close as possible, right? We want this uh, y tilde and y prime to be as close as possible. So what we are going to do is we're going to just take this two thing. Oh, wow, what? <laughs> uh, not what I expect it to do. Where should I fit this in here? Yeah, here looks good. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So we are going to fit this thing. This to Y. Oh, no. Actually, I should just use the other application. <laughs> Wait, can I flip back to the end? This, this is really weird. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Okay, I will use this. Okay, this is much easier, I hope. Uh, oh, here we are. Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this y and this y prime and we're going to fit it through maybe a mean square error, right? We're, we're going we're gonna to use a mean square error to make sure that they, this mean square error is reduced, right? So now we have two loss functions. We have one which is the, the binary cross entropy at the top, which we will try to make sure that your prediction is as close as a true label as possible. And for those that doesn't have labels, we're just going to fit it through a mean square. We're going to fit it through some perturbation twice, get two different noisy x, and then classify them. And we want those results to be as close as possible with this mean square error, error here. So the last thing to do, of course, is to just add them together. But you know, there's an art to adding them because in the beginning of the training, you don't want so much of the lower network to do its work, right? You want your network to be as good as possible in predicting the correct labels. So perhaps what you want to do is you want to weight this loss function. You want to take a sum of this, you want to take a weighted sum of this. You want to consider the weight so that at the beginning of the training, the network at the top, so this particular network, is going to receive more of these weights, right? So WT is going to be close to one uh, at a start, right? Uh, if WT is W, uh, if we consider the loss to be WT uh, times the BCE plus one minus WT times the mean square error, right? Then we want, we want this to be close to one at the start, right? And as time goes by, we want to um, sort of put more emphasis to the second network over here, all right? So I guess that's the intuition behind um, the pi model. In fact, this is exactly what the pi model is, right? You just take some, you just take some x, you fit it into some stochastic argumentation, uh, fit it twice into it, uh, put it into some network with a dropout, and then you fit this thing. Uh, yeah, so you fit this z, uh, you fit this z, and you fit this z prime. In, sorry, z tilde into this square difference. Then uh, if you have labels. Then you do this path, go into cross entropy, and you get another loss function. You weight sum together, and then you get your loss function. You get prop, and you're done. Right? Simple. Okay. So this is a basic model that we can start off with. Um, let's try to improve it. Yeah. Mm. Why don't you just not do augmentation? I guess it's. I guess it's just like a, um, it makes the algorithm look nicer in some way, <laughs> right? You just have to say uh, you have a WT and then the WT decay exponentially, I don't know, right? Yeah, 
I think in the in the yeah oh here's the algorithm right let's let's see what the algorithm do um so oh they didn't mention how they decay wt here but yeah what you can do for wt is just if it's exponential you can see that you don't have another separate train i'm i'm sure whatever you just um uh whatever you just propose will work right it's the general idea either way but you want a kind of a smooth continuation between taking, um, putting more emphasis on one over the other over time. You want a smooth, gradual flow of that. So perhaps that's why. Yeah. Mm. Um, I do have one question that I'm not very sure. Um, I went to check the original paper and it seems like this is also what they wrote here. So if you take close consideration here, if you take a look at this, they actually divide by um, the cardinality of B. So B is the, B is the mini batch, right? But over here, this is the part where you're training the supervised loss component, right? So you're just taking B intercept L. L, L is the one that is labeled, right? So you're just taking all the labeled data from that mini batch and you're doing the cross entropy here. So in that case, why do you divide by B instead, divide by the cardinal of B instead of divide by cardinal of B intercept L? That's something I'm not very sure about. Uh, so anyone knows why? So B is um, the mini batch itself. L is the set of all labeled data. So B in the set L is the set of all labeled data in that mini batch. So over here, it seems like they are trying to find the cross entropy error here. Um, but they are dividing by the cardinality of B instead of cardinality of B in the set L, which kind of weird. I will expect it to be P in the set L actually. Um, sorry, where? Oh, over here, can this C. Um, I'm going to guess it's just a constant. Yeah. Let me see. I think it's just a constant. I'm not very sure. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, why, why not one divided by B intercept? So I'm just going to go on from here. I guess nobody have the answer now. Um, so so I think you can assume the fact that they actually explicitly write that is the cardinal would be probably means that the the batch can be different. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that I can think of is what if um, in that batch there has no labor data, then this will be one divided by zero. That's going to be bad. I don't know. Yeah. So, you can think about that, I guess. Mm. Okay, so let's extend this technique a little bit, right? Let's introduce temporal ensembling. Uh, I'm going to redraw whatever we have just now. Okay, so we have y, right, and then we have x, right, and x gets split into two, go into this network, go into another, you know, go into 
uh, this is a stochastic permutation, and this is the uh, neural network. And then over here, we put them together. Right, put them to, we put these two together, uh, take the binary cross entropy. And over here, we take these two, and then we fit it through the mean square. So this is, this is pi model, right? So let us improve on this pi model a bit. Uh, in particular, let's think about how we, we, can do, we can do away this portion, right? Because right now what we're trying to do is we just take some x, we, we, we perturbate it differently twice, and then we try to predict something from it. So let's do it a little bit differently. Um, what we're gonna do is to do some sort of ensemble link, right? I'm gonna put it in red, that's the changes I'll make. So what I'm gonna do is, instead of having x fit into this like that, uh, I am going to fit it into just one um, perturbation. This is the, the stochastic perturbation, and then the neural network. And then this thing will go into the binary cross entropy if there is label. And if there is no label, what we're gonna do, it's simple. We're going to predict some z here, right? We're going to predict some z right here. So we're going to keep track of this z, okay? We keep track of this z. So we will keep track of this z at all time. Um, let's call this z tilde, right? So we keep track of z tilde at all time. And what we want to do is we want to take, we want to take z tilde and we want to make this mean square error to be as small as possible, right? So what we are trying to do here is that instead of using, um, so previously in pi model, the target that we're using is just the z that you get from another perturbation of the original image x, right? So why not we take um, an ensemble over all possible z's that was predicted throughout history, right? So this is the, this is the main idea of temporal ensembling, okay? So what this z is, is just basically, um, so after you, after you predict some z here, right, you update your z. So you could say that this is uh, some wt of z plus one minus wt of z tilde, right? So you update it recursively. Okay, so if you expand this formula, you can actually see that this is a weighted average over, an exponentially weighted average over, um, of the z's over time, right? Okay, so, then this z tilde will become your new target that you'll try to, uh, try to classify this with, to try to make this mean square root as small as possible, okay? And this is essentially, this is essentially temporal ensembling, right? You can see here the z goes here, uh, the z also goes up from here and goes to here, and then we update, let's look at the algorithm, we update the z accordingly. So in particular, this is the update, right? This particular portion. So just an interesting question. Maybe it will be fun. Um, why do you need to divide by this term? Because this, this particular term is already like an exponential weighted average, right? Uh, it's already an exponential weighted average, right? So then why do you want z tilde, which is the one that you will fit into the next iteration to have a divide by one minus alpha half t term? Perhaps a little clue, why, con why not consider when you do not have any z? Okay, so do note that z is initialized to zero at the beginning. So at the first iteration, your z is zero. So what were doing, what will you get when you do this? Oh, what will you get when you do this particular thing? Right, you get this, this z is zero, right? So this term is canceled. So you get alpha z, right? And alpha z is no good because alpha is something less than one. In the first iteration, oh, sorry, I shouldn't erase that one. I should have erased this one, right? So you get, yeah, you get this particular value, right? So this is no good because you have one minus alpha z and one minus alpha is less, it's between zero and one, it's not exactly um, one. But you expect that when you only have one sample, your temporal example target is going to be exactly that one sample, right? 
so if you look at the first iteration, what we're effectively dividing is just by dividing one minus alpha. So or originally you have one minus alpha times z, and then after this step, you divide by one minus alpha, you effectively get the z. Okay, I, I guess this is the way I look at it, and uh, I didn't work through like for the next step, but at least for the first step, it makes sense, right? They're trying to normalize it such that this estimate isn't biased. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, any questions about this so far? Okay, got to speed up. Um, so let's think about how do we do better. So this is where I diverge a little bit from the lecture slides. Um, yeah, let's let's try to think about how do we how do we do better, right? So we have temporal ensembling. We have temporal ensembling network right here. Um, there are two things that you can improve in this network. So the first thing that you could do is that you could have a better target, right? So we look at pi model and we say that, well, pi model has this some, some targets that we use. We fit x twice and then we get that as a target. Um, yeah, it's unsafe. Okay, yeah, so we get as a target and then we introduce temporal ensembling where our target now is our ensemble over all the previous time steps, right? So can we think about a better target? So this is one thing that we want to ask. The second thing that we might want to ask is, this particular portion right here, where we say we just stochastically augment this thing, right, perturbate this image in some sense, is there a better way we can actually do randomization right here, right? So this is the second question that we want to answer. So these two questions leads to two different techniques. Um, the first technique to solve the first problem is mean teacher, right? So the mean teacher is trying to solve the better target problem. So let's see how we do that. So I can, I can sum up the mean teacher in a very simple mean, right? So if you want to be the role model, if you want to be the role, te role model teacher, what you need to do is you just look at all the answers that a student has, and then you just, you just take the weighted sum of that, weighted average of that, right? And this is essentially how mean teacher work. Let's look at a network, right? It's simple, right? Uh, so over here, it's sort of like temporal ensemble in some sense, right? Except you're ensembling different things. So, you have the signature thing where you have this labor data, and then what you want to do is you want to reduce the classification cost between the labor data and what the uh, model predicts, right? So you still have this component. This is very similar to the, to the binary cross entropy component that you have in the temporal ensembling. But instead of having the target um, being proposed by an ensemble over all the previous time steps, what you're gonna do is you are going to have a teacher over here that will propose a target for you, right? So let's imagine you have an ideal teacher, right? The ideal teacher can tell you what the true, uh, the true, true prediction should be, right? So if the teacher is ideal, it's like an oracle, then you can ensure that this consistency cost is, if you can ensure that this consistency cost is minimized, then what you really have is a good prediction um, network, right? Because this, this, this um, Oracle teacher is gonna tell you the true labors. Then, well, if it tell you the true labors, you just have to reduce, say, the classification cost between the teacher and the student, and you are really good, right? But of course, in real world, your unlabeled data are not going to have any labors, right? That's why they are called unlabeled data. So what do you do with that? So what you do with that is that you want this teacher to be as good as possible. And we're just gonna use the idea of ensembling here also. So to do that, um, we are gonna do it like how we do it in temporal ensembling, except instead of ensembling over the target Z, we are gonna ensemble over the model itself, right? So it's, it's funny, so what you take is you take, um, at the first step, you train it with some, uh, you initialize the student and teacher to do the same. And the second step, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take the average, the weight, uh, the exponential weights of, uh, sorry, exponential average over the two students, and then that will be the teacher's model. And then the third step, you again take the exponential average over the three, the, 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 the three students, and then that will be your new teacher, and so on and so forth, right? So you can actually see that this, this can be done like progressively, okay? So I just have one question. Um, why do you think this is better? as compared to temporal ensembling. Let's not talk about like prediction wise, why is it better? Right? Because I don't see any intuition from here. 
um, let's talk about in terms of space complexity. Like why it's this much more efficient in terms of space complexity than, than temporal ensembles? Oh, I can't yes. Yeah. So the number of parameters that you need over here is just say say um this we only need around uh, actually we only need bah, we only need O of data right this is the number of this is the number of um, space that we need for this okay um but if you look at temporal ensembling. It's troubling because what you're trying to do is you are taking an ensemble over all the previous time steps um, and the ensemble is over the targets, right? So for each data, for each unlabeled data, you need to keep track of the running target. So if the number of unlabeled data that you have is huge, that's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> It's, in fact, it's linear in the space of the number of training data that you have. Right? And in, in the usual case, when you want to use this kind of techniques, you have like a shit ton of um, uh, unlabeled data, right? So I'm going to keep track of that. Okay, so now let's move on to dealing with the second problem, which is the better, better randomization problem. Uh, this, this is actually not going to be a randomization um, technique anymore. Um, but let's, let's think about it. Right? Let's see if you could link those two up together because I can't. Um, So actually to add on to that, uh, in fact, you don't have to explicitly say that you need to keep track of all the students uh, at some time because um, what you can do is this, you can, um, let's see, it's black here. So it's white here, uh, it's okay, so let's, let's, let's do it here, right? So, oh, you can't, let's do it here. All right, so essentially if you have some data at some time t, Right, so this is the teacher model at time t. Let's call it t t. So this is just equals. You can just set this to be equals to the teacher's model at time t minus one uh, times alpha plus one minus alpha times the student model at time t minus one. Right. So this is already a weighted sum because if you expand this formula out recursively, is you will get like one minus alpha of t minus one plus one minus alpha square data of t minus two of the student and so on and so forth. All right, so it's already a way to solve. Hmm. Okay, so in fact, um, this is the proper way to do it in the algorithm that they propose if you look at the source material. Okay, so, okay, let, let's get to this. Right, this I'm not super sure how I can explain it. Uh, I don't even know how you can actually put it into the, the, the training itself, so you need to help me a bit with this. Um, but I'm going to give you some intuition first, right? So virtual adversarial training, well, adversarial training in general goes all the way back to Ian Goodfellow again, right? So there was this one paper some time back ago where he talked about trying to, uh, trying to, 
okay, let's let's restart that, right? So what you have is that after you have a model, um, what Good Follow again found is that you can actually perturb that image that you fit into the classifier just by a little bit, such that the output of that classifier is going to be drastically different, right? So does that make sense? Right, so you perturb it by later maybe change just one pixel and suddenly the whole image is uh, originally it was like a cat and now it's like a beast, right? So I don't know, right? You could do that. Um, so the idea of doing something like that is called adversarial, uh, it's, it's, it's an adversarial example, right? If you give that to that, it's an adversarial example. So we're gonna formalize this a little bit more, okay? So essentially, uh, in here what we're gonna formalize is this, right? We're gonna say that, um, let me check. Yes, okay, cool, right. Yeah, so what you have is some distribution P of Y given X. Okay, so what if you perturbate X by a letter, what would be the distribution of P of Y given X plus epsilon, right? So epsilon is some like small perturbation. You perturbate your image by a letter. What happened to this distribution after you perturbate it? Right, that's the question we want to ask. In particular, we want to ask maybe what's the KL divergence between these two things uh, when you perturbate, say, the image by letter. Okay, so we would define the adversarial example, the most adversarial example, to be the one to be the one perturbation, to be the one perturbation, the epsilon, that caused this to be maximized. Okay, so you choose a perturbation such that the difference between P of Y given X and P of Y given X plus epsilon it is big, right? It's the biggest it can get, okay? And of course, you know, this, this formulation doesn't stop epsilon from being something that plus, plus a whole lot of way, all the way so that you get into the cat's region, right? So we need to make sure that we constrain epsilon so that uh, this epsilon is not too big, right? Let's say it's, it's small, let's say, this is an L symbol delta. So this is the formulation, right? Oh, they use R and epsilon here. Okay, so let me repeat a bit, right? So you have some distribution, uh, Q of Y given X. Uh, let's think about this as P of Y given X, right? And if you perturbate the input by some R, where R is a small perturbation with norm not greater than epsilon, uh, what, is the, what is the particular R that will make this divergence to be as big as possible, right? We will call this the adversarial example, R of X, right? It's the adversarial direction, okay? So essentially what we want to do is to minimize this thing, right? We want to minimize, so what, what does this tell you? What is this L of adversarial? L of adversarial is trying to tell you that, well, if you perturbate it by the worst possible perturbation, the perturbation that will make this the largest, how do I make sure that I can minimize this thing, right? It's not like a mean max game in some sense where uh, the, the, the max, the mean player, the mean player, sorry, the max player is trying to screw you over and you as the mean player is trying to predict what the max player is going to be screwing you over as and trying to reduce that screwness, screwiness of it, okay? So sort of, it's sort of like a min max game over here, right? So the problem with this formulation is that there is no closed form for this. In particular, there's no closed form for Q of Y given X, right? And why is that so? Keen is unlabeled data, right? You have unlabeled data, so you obviously do not have the probability of Y given X, right? Because if you have probability of Y given X, you have a label data, right? So in here, you don't have labels. So P of Y given X is generally unknown. So too bad, there's no closed form for this. And so what we do, um, at least in Goodfellow's paper, what he did is he make a first order approximation. Um, yeah, I'm just going to put it here, right? You can read the paper. I'm not explaining in depth for this because there's one more speaker. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so, so here we're gonna introduce the unlabeled data now, okay? So the unlabeled data, let's denote unlabeled data as X of, um, X of UL and labeled data as of L. So the formulation just changed slightly, right? In the sense that um, 
what we are only considering is that we're considering over all the possible axes where x can be either labeled or unlabeled, right? So you can see that all the, all the places where we have x now is x star, where x star is the unions, oh sorry, is the unions of x l and x u l, okay? So, but the formulation remains the same, okay? So the problem is, again, we don't have that, right? We don't have the, the y given x because unlabeled data. So what do we do? So we replace it by, so we, we go back to like the variation of autoencoder style. If we don't have that, we just create a distribution and we hope to train the distribution to be as, fit as close as possible to, to the true Q of Y given X. So this is the idea that we use here, right? We just say, oh, let's have a neural net. Well, you know, let's parameterize this by data hat and hope to train it in some way. And this is exactly what they do. Um, so now your P is here, uh, is not parameterized by data. Um, and you just basically try to minimize this particular error. That's essentially virtual adversarial network. Um, so in the context of how this thing is linked to um, the models that we have described just now, it's a bit hard to see how it, it comes into play, right? So perhaps anyone wants to give it a try on enlightening us a bit? All this idea about adversarial examples of trying to create an adversarial examples, how do you fit it into the original task that we have of trying to learn a supervised model with help of un unlabeled data? Go back to that. Blah, 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 blah. Yep, here. But let's use time order. Uh, time order is simple. Let's use time order. Yeah. I think, in general, I think you can read this source material. Uh, it's actually quite a deep literature. Like it goes all the way back to where good fellow starts. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just on dying. I don't know why Zoom is so unstable. Oh, is it still recording? It is. Okay. Um, so we have to share again. Okay. Anyway, I only have one last slide left. Um, I sort of, I'm not sure if this is how, uh, okay, never mind, let's wait for a while. Yeah, just wait for it to come up. Uh, It'll come up. Yay, okay. Okay, so another way I look at it, uh, not I look at it, but the paper looks at it, is that um, 
whatever that we just derived, you know, this, this whole term that you want to minimize, right? You can treat this as a regularization term when you are trying to train your um, temporal ensembling model, right? So instead of just um, having a loss function like this L, where we originally have, we are going to add in a term, which is basically this term, right? Which is basically this term. And we'll just use it as a regularization term. Right. I don't have intuition for that. Again, I'm just like grabbing it from the paper and showing it to you. Um, but I guess if you have some intuition and you want to share, that would be great. Um, if not, that would be the end of my segment. Any questions? So yeah, just one thing. Um, these are not in the original lecture, I believe. Right, so um, you need to read the materials. Because <laughs> I think the, the origin lecture only have one slide, and I don't understand what they're trying, uh, yeah. So I can't explain it very well either, so. Mm. Okay, so. Thank you. Yeah, it's over here. This one, right? Oh, yeah. This is the one with your name yeah. on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and then you can add it. You have to transfer it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Good evening. 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 2019, yeah. Uh, before we get into GPT-2, let's take a look at uh, unsupervised learning first. Here, when I say unsupervised, unsupervised learning, uh, I'm referring to unsupervised learning for language. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why does unsupervised learning work now? Yeah. Uh, Actually, the uh, research of pre-trained language modeling is uh, very popular now. Uh, the big answer is that uh, now we have a new architecture like transformer, and uh, we have enough compute than before. And we can relatively, we, we are relatively easy to train a uh, language model uh, than before, yeah. That's the big answer. So the, the, the invention of Transformer by Google in 2017 is a breakthrough in uh, this area. Uh, yeah, most of current uh, pre-trained language models are based on the, this architecture. I believe uh, most of you have heard of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, technique, yeah. Uh, okay, next. Uh, for GPT-2, the core idea is a, uh, they think, OpenAI think, that uh, if a model can predict uh, ne the next model well, really, really well, or well enough to, uh, they, they think the model can understand a lot about a language. So again, uh, that's the core idea. Uh, that's not a mathematical proof, but only a idea and claim. Uh, so, with this idea, they use the anti, they use the attention me uh, mechanism to uh, predict predict the next word. Uh, actually, the attention 
it really help helpful uh, in the task. Yeah. Uh, why why attention <coughs> is useful uh, than health uh, LSTM? Uh, because it can easily refer to uh, past work uh, than LSTM. You know, the uh, attention can just uh, refer to uh, words before, yeah, because the, the not a sequence like, uh, like uh, LSTM. So now what we need to do is just to train, the, um, train a model which can Predict the predict the next word really well. Let's open AI. Uh, actually, do a deed. Okay. Uh, so that that um about uh, uh attention mechanism. <coughs> um, attention looks like uh. Okay. Can we come back again? I don't don't know. And I think it's just because it's doing some encoding. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at the dictionary first. Giving a key to a dictionary, you can uh, get a corresponding corresponding value uh, from the dictionary if it uh, exists. For the attention, uh, we treat the list of key and the we pair uh, as a dictionary and given a vector of Q. Uh, as a, a key, you can get the a vector of V as the corresponding value. Yeah. Is that a mix? Does that make sense? And uh, then the attention is useful for the next word as mentioned before. Uh, when predating the next word, we we are uh, easier to, it's very easy to refer the past word if needed. Okay, uh, let's move on to the transformer. Um, transformer, uh, we, the, the attention mechanism in transformer uh, include, consists of uh, multi held attention and self attention. Yeah, the, it uh, solves a long-term de dependencies problem, and uh, uh, the autoaggressivity allows uh, this architecture for parallelization over time. So it uh, uh, that that trick uh, makes the model train uh, fast. Yeah. Okay. The summary. Uh, we just need to create, uh, change the mo large model to which can predict the next word really well. And uh, uh, how to train the model? We just use the attention mechanism, and uh, because it can make uh, it easy to look things up in the past. Okay, now we are to, uh, take a look at uh, the GPT-2. Uh, let's review the path to GPT-2 first. In 2017, OpenAI released a sentiment neuron uh, model. It uh, was trained use uh, with LSTM and on a data set named Amazon review, uh, Reviews. It, uh, uh, the, the target is it, it just uh, present the next character in the Amazon, Amazon review. And, uh, after training, he, they, they, think, they thought that uh, it can gain the knowledge about the statement. Yeah, so it, with, the, with the trained model, it uh, can pre uh, given a uh, Amazon review, it can predict really the statement of the uh, text. And uh, in 2018, okay, the GPT-1 was released. It's a GPT two brother, and it has twelve layer, layers. Uh, it or it just used the transformer decoder part, and it has uh, one hundred meaning 
uh, parameters, and it contains contains size is five hundred and twelve. The it, the model was trained on a data set named the books corpus. Yeah. Uh, it it was released uh, uh, after Elma and before Broad. Okay. And uh, come to 2019, uh, OpenAI released uh, GPT-2. It uh, has Okay. okay, we have you guys Thanks. here. Okay, let's continue. <coughs> GPT-2 has 48 layer, layers and it uh, has have a huge uh, parameters, huge size parameter uh, one and a half billion. And its content size is bigger than GPT-1, uh, 1024. It, it was trained on uh, a high, uh, much more data set and uh, it's a hierarchy data set called uh, main, uh, web test by uh, OpenAI. Uh, compared uh, with GPT-1, I think the main upgrade uh, has three of them. The first one is it uh, was trained on a higher variety data set called a uh, uh, web test. And uh, the second one is it, uh, the, the, the model is uh, bigger than the previous one. It has about uh, one, half, one and a half billion parameters. Now the third one, it uh, remove, removed the file training step. It just used the unsupervised, unsupervised learning uh, approach to, to test on the, on the other ta tasks. Uh, okay. They trained the four size, uh, four different sized uh, models uh, from 100 million to one and a half billion. The first one, uh, yeah, the first one is the same as the GPT-1. Okay, after train, training the GPT-2, they conduct uh, the experiment on the uh, different uh, uh, language modeling, modeling tasks. Uh, GPT-2 achieved a state of that on uh, Winograd, Scrammer, Lambda, and other language modeling tasks. Um, let, uh, for example, the Winograd Scrammer challenge, it, it was better than the previous best model by uh, about 7%. It's a bigger jump. And uh, for the task of a window grad scammer challenge, uh, how, many, how many of you have heard of this task? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's look at uh, the sentences here. The first sentence. The trophy doesn't fit into the brown kit case because it is too large. The uh, ha, have two choices. The correct answer here, it refers to trophy. Yeah. And the second uh, sentence, the trophy doesn't fit into the brown kit case because it is too small. Yeah, there, uh, there, there are also two choices. Uh, the correct answer, the correct answer, it refers case now. So the difference between the two sentences is only one word. It just replaced the uh, large in the first sentence with small and uh, it gen generated the second sentence. Yeah. It's very hard for a model to, to solve this problem, I think. Yeah. Because for the traditional uh, 
conceptualize the learning, uh, like uh, with the embedding, the large and the small have a uh, have the same similar uh, embedding, because they yeah they can they can the, the both words can replace each other. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, let's uh, go back to the previous slide. Uh, yeah. Hey, sorry. Yeah. After training GPT two, uh, with the on this task, it uh, achieved uh, seventeen percent. Yeah, accuracy. Without any fountain. Okay, uh, after training GPT-2, they conduct uh, uh, their experiments on four different uh, tasks. Uh, the four tasks are open domain question answering and uh, uh, reading comprehension and uh, uh, summarization and machine translation. Let's uh, take a look at uh, open domain question answering first. This slide is added by myself. The, the original slide doesn't have this slide. <coughs> uh, this is a, a model uh, named Dr. QE. It's a very famous model for QE, which is open domain question answer. Uh, the approach they used, uh, I like that. Uh, the, the model contains two components. The first component is document retrieval. The second one is document reader. With document retriever, the uh, it can we are given a question like like the showing in the picture here. Uh, they retrieve several those that top and uh, relevant documents first from uh, Wikipedia. And uh, with the document reader it uh, it tried the it tried the correct answer from the uh, candidate Candidate uh, documents. Yeah, there are two steps. Yeah. It's a euro way to open domain question answering. And uh, with with GPT two, you just giving it a question, like the first one who wrote the book, the original of this dish. The GPT two can generate the answer, the correct answer. Yeah, uh, showing here. Why, why GPT two can uh, finish this task like that, like this? Uh, they believe that they because it it was trained over a large large data set. It uh, <coughs> already contained uh, enough facts of the world, world, and they they believe they think that they can generate the answer. That's the, that's the idea. Okay, uh, this slide shows that uh, among the four trained models, the bigger models worked better. Yeah, the four points. Okay, let's move on to the reading comprehension task. <coughs> okay, how many of you have heard of this task? Reading comprehension. Oh, right. The most famous 
skill set I think is to go to one and to go to two, released by Stanford University. Yeah. <coughs> Reading comprehension task is giving a piece of text and uh, you ask the one question. The answer is required to answer the question based on the uh, type. <coughs> uh, okay, for GPT-2, a language model, how does it fit this task? And uh, what they did is like that, they, they, they put the text and uh, the question answer pairs as the context. Because uh, in the data set, uh, one piece of text has about 10 question answer pairs. Yeah, he, he treat a text question answer, question answer, question answer, and essential. And uh, they, they treat the, the who uh, text and the question answer pairs as the context. The, and uh, ask the last question, and uh, the question is, did they climb any mountains? Yeah, the model, he output the answer, uh, Everest, and the ground truth is unknown or yes. Unknown and yes. Actually, the Everest is the correct answer. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, any comprehension? Other page. The, no, the model answer here, because the model is a language model, it was generated by the model. He, he can't give the, uh, for the, ta for the uh, original task, uh, the ground truth, ground truth is unknown or yes. Yeah, but uh, the ye or if the answer is yes, uh, what mountain did they climb? Everest. Okay, did they climb any mountains? If the answer is yes, means they actually climbed a mountain. Yeah, the mountain, the name of the mountain is Everest. So, uh, given the piece of text as the context, the language model learns that for this, for this question, it can answer with Everest. Okay. Okay. Good explanation. Yeah. Good understanding. That's another illustration. For the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> this slide also shows that the bigger model works better. Okay. Let's take a look at the 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 rest two tasks. The first one is for the machine translation, and the second one is summarization. For uh, machine translation, the uh, in order to induce the language model to solve this problem, they put a, a series a pair, a, some example pairs as the context and uh, uh, put the last the the last uh, fr French sentence is as the the predictor. Uh, okay, pre the, the the model needed to predict the uh, the last uh, French sentence. Uh, 
yeah, for the machine learning lesson. For the summary, it just uh, append uh, TL PR uh, to the article. Yeah. And uh, this uh, summarization results. If uh, it uh, was not uh, as good as the data part, but uh, there is an interesting thing that if we don't put the TLDR after the test, the performance is 50. And uh, if, if we put the TLDR after the test for, for, for GPT-2, we get a, a big boost to 21.4, yeah. That's their observation, yeah. So for the simulation task, the bigger model also works better. And the position later, position also prove that Okay, uh, I would like to emphasize that there is no file turn until now. And uh, yeah, it, uh, the, all the results are gained without a function. We just need to train the, the GPT-2 and uh, transfer the model to the uh, particular task and you can get a uh, uh, improve. Okay, let's let's take a look at uh, the quick example generated by GPT-2. Uh, this is about uh, recycling. Recycling is good for the world, and uh, no, you could uh, not be more wrong. Uh, and uh, the rest are generated by GPT-2. Uh, this, okay, uh, this is very coherent, yeah. This, uh, uh, but uh, the human being will not uh, be like that. You can read that, or I can read that. Uh, recycling is not good for the world. It is bad for the environment. It is bad for our health. And it is bad for our economy. I'm not kidding. Recycling is not good for the environment. Yeah, something like that. And another cool example generated by GPT-2 is from, from Reddit. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, fake news. And uh, there is a comment that I can see how GPT-2 could uh, maliciously be used to generate a believable fake news. And that, that's their worries, yeah. So let's talk about the partial release. Partial, uh, OpenAI only released the small model. We didn't uh, release the biggest model, GPT-2. Uh, they, why they did that? They think uh, um, uh, machine learning is becoming more powerful and uh, impactful. It can be used to generate, uh, apply, uh, generate a million applications, but uh, in potential for malicious use, it can be used in malicious applications. So that's their worries. And, uh, there, there is no existing norms for responsible disclose. Yeah, uh, the the best model usually released later than the uh, invention. So, but it can never release. All these issues will become far more severe in the future. Yeah, that's the, that that's the uh, worries. So, what do you think about that? Yeah, about their partial release.
raise a lot of funds. I don't know what the what situation is. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for your attention.